This is episode 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 of the Animal Welfare video, half-hour video exclusive to WABC that you can get almost every week. All you have to do is go to your YouTube and then type in Red Apple Media, and this is what you see. Nancy, my wife, animal rescuer, who uh, has been joined by so many others in the animal Guardian Angel Animal Protection Division of the Guardian Angels, and yours truly, obviously, host here at WABC, and Nancy is also co-host of the Animal Welfare Hour, again, exclusive to WABC Radio, that you can hear every Sunday night. It's the last hour that I broadcast each week, 11 to 12, and we get the most calls, we get the most response, the most requests, 11 to 12, and if you've missed any of the previous radio editions, you want to share it with others, but you may want to hear it yourself first. Go to WABCRadio.com. That's WABCRadio.com for all your podcasting needs. But today, in Episode 8, it's a very, very, very special edition. Because it's ironic when any of our family members, our furry little four-legged friends, pass into the hereafter and go to Critter Heaven, because we know there's only Critter Heaven. There's not Critter Purgatory or Hell. They are following a long line of others that was so special in all of your lives, whether they were with you for a short period of time or a long period of time, that it hurts to this day. I know I've spoken to many of you. It's hurting Nancy and I. In essence, it's ironic, episode 8. In the Jewish tradition, when people die, people sit shiva for eight days in mourning. And as you know, the mourning never ends. And this was an extraordinarily special cat that we call Tuna, a Russian blue, who against all odds, and I mean Nancy's going to go into great detail, had the strongest will to survive of any human being or any animal that I have ever met in my 69 years. This little cat, this Russian blue beautiful cat, like the size of a kitten, Nancy will describe why. But time and time again, when we thought she was on her deathbed, when she could probably breathe and not function any longer, she somehow would resurrect herself. So Nancy, could you tell us a special story about Tuna? I have to label the most special cat in the world. Well, Tuna uh, was a rescue from Animal Care and Control was on the kill list, which means tuna wasn't available for public adoption. So, yeah, so tuna was already on this, you know, a very small, small possibility of ever having a second chance. So uh, this was on my birthday that we wound up making the decision. Um, I had looked to see, um, you know, what cats were available, which cats weren't taken for the day, and tuna wasn't taken. So, uh, you know, I just decided to take Tuna. I took Tuna without, uh, you know, having uh, met her. And I knew that she was a senior, which, you know, makes it more difficult for them to get adopted as well. Uh, And the history of her, the history is very little. But, you know, what they do when they come in is they um, come into the shelters. They do a very, you know, like a thorough sort of exam just to see what they have potentially. And right away, they, you know, just start medicating them. So... Uh, you know, Tuna's issues were pretty extensive, so I can see why it was going to be um, a tough road with Tuna. So just a small list of, of stuff. I had to write it down because there was so many I forgot. Um, conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis. Yeah. What is that? With the teeth? Well, the, yeah, so, it, yeah, that also has to do with, um, like, buildups uh, in, like, different passageways. So, like, uh, you know, um, whether it's through... An inflammation or a cold, it could be uh, watering of the eyes, it could, you know, through the nose, things like that. So constantly struggling to breathe. Yeah, so it's almost like an infection, like a little bit of an underlying infection. The corneal scarring, which we saw, um, that was affecting her ability to see, which she maintained until, you know, she passed. And then also uh, her eyes were just, you know, uh, it was hard for her to keep them 
moist because you know she's not seeing right, so she's not like putting them opening them. Well, that's that's windows. ironic. All of these things are exactly what human beings uh, suffer from. You had yeah. that same thing, the cornea yeah. scarring in which you lost your sight. Yeah, and she was, and then also dehydrated, right? So that could explain, you know, why it's tough for the eyes to function. Now underweight, and that was uh, a complete understatement because. Uh, she's estimated to be 10 years old, and she was only four pounds, which is, like, unheard of. That's, like, where kittens are. Right. In fact, many of our kittens, she's smaller. She was smaller than the kittens themselves, even though she was our senior citizen cat of all the many that we had in our colony. That's why I gave her the nickname AARP, because <laughs> I'm AARP, mm -hmm. and Tuna was AARP. Yeah, and as you can see from this picture, where she has her tongue hanging out, so she had uh, stage four dental disease, like severe dental disease. Now, this is um, fairly common with uh, any, you know, house cats, uh, especially and outdoor cats, that, that too, because, you know, that's going to be the number one thing that starts a lot of ailments with them, their teeth. Um, they're, you know, if they're not being cleaned or brushed or, you know, again, but more like they're, they're having debris left in their teeth, you know, certain types of foods. And then once the teeth get compromised, that's where the infections start getting in. So it's almost like a number one that all of these um, older animals usually have dental disease. Well, let's just address that for yeah. a second. Mm -hmm. What could be done for cats to prevent this since it is so prevalent in both the cats who live indoors yeah. and the feral cats? Well, so for instance, if you have indoor cats, now that's within your control because there are certain things that, you know, you can like brush their teeth at home. Um, you know, if you have like a decent relationship with them, it shouldn't be that tough to get near them like that. Sometimes people have tougher times doing that. So uh, when they're bringing their uh, pet for like maybe like a yearly checkup or visit, they'll do the things that are harder for them to do, like the nail clippings, um, you know, because it's in a more controlled environment. Uh, but, you know, and then also it's the types of food they have. So, for instance, when their teeth start to get a little compromised. See, I'm a big proponent of the soft food for cats because it doesn't, um, you know, it does, it's not as much uh, of a difficulty on their teeth, but also because once they start to have these gum issues and teeth issues, that's very difficult for them to eat, so that's very painful. So I'm um, a big fan of, especially for older cats, always a soft diet. I mean, the less chewing they have to do, um, the less debris that can get stuck, because they can also just wash it through with water. So imagine if they're outside, they eat food, but they don't have a bowl of water. That stuff's going to get stuck on their feet, like with a person on their teeth. And the most interesting thing about Tuna, as she would struggle to go towards the bowl with the soft food, yeah. she would peck at it <laughs> the way a pigeon yeah. would peck at a kernel in the street. She couldn't eat the food the way a healthy cat would she would peck on it, and half of it would end up on the floor. Yeah, I mean, it would, you know, it would be a long uh, time for her, but she would always get everything ultimately in there. So it's like she would take something from the dish, which uh, would have, like, elevated dishes for her, and then, like, little debris would fall lower, and then she would go after the little pieces. So it was almost like she had a, a certain method of, of uh, eating. But to your point about how she was, um, that body movement, the last thing that they diagnosed her with is something called ataxia. So now let me get that straight. Ataxia. Ataxia. Okay. So this ex this is the explanation for why she is basically overriding the way she is, and we don't know how she got it or when she got it. She could have been born with it, but this is what affects that her muscular system, and so depending upon what type she had or when she got it, she could have gotten it from her mother at birth if she was born outdoors and lived her whole life like this, so she maybe never knew anything different. But she could have also developed it later. So, you know, it could be, it's like a neurological disorder. It affects the ability, so the brain knows what it wants to do, but it can't coordinate with the muscles. So that's why they, it, the most um, sort of symbolic trait is the gait of the walk, which is why as she would walk all the time, she would fall, because she couldn't keep her steps coordinated. Well, this would be similar to what humans have, uh, MS, muscular sclerosis, yeah. where the muscles are just not able to support the yeah. framework of the body when walking or moving. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes a human being would fall at a much earlier age than they should. I mean, it's a, a danger for seniors. That's why they had the pendant medic alert. And I always <laughs> joke that we would have to get the pendant, pendant medic alert <laughs> for Tuna because she would constantly fall. Now, how did you remedy that? 
Well, so when so she had like um, certain ups and downs in terms of her mobility. When she did get it better and she was able to walk um, more, I have steps around the apartment. So, you know, because she couldn't jump at all, so this way she could still participate like all the other cats. Um, but that became difficult for her to walk up even, you know, steps like this big. So um, she would, you know, I put the, uh, basically it's like the sort of floor padding that if you went to like a gym or maybe like a school playground, the soft padding that goes on the floor. So when you fall, uh, you don't injure yourself. And what I did was they're in squares and you put them together and I lined the entire um, living area where she is with that. So this way when she did fall, and then, you know, in addition to like little carpet runners, so it was always a softer fall than the wood floor. So, and, you know, and I think she appreciated it because she got up a lot faster after yeah, that. And she would struggle to get up, but she would always struggle to get up. Now, I think what's key about Tuna is, is that she clearly was impaired. Mm -hmm. So you bring her back from animal care and control, the shelter that was ready to destroy her, euthanize her. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure when you came in at the last second, they were like, oh, this cat will never live. Yeah. Oh, what a waste of time. You should have just let it us euthanize her because it's an assembly line for death when they can't foster or adopt out any of their cats or dogs or other animals. So in this particular situation, she's now exposed to cats she's not known and grown up with. Mm -hmm. Bigger cats, healthier cats, older cats, middle-aged cats, younger cats, male cats, female cats. And yet I never noticed that they preyed on her. They did, it wasn't like Darwinian, survival <laughs> of the fittest. Yeah where immediately they perceived of her as weak, yeah. like maybe in a feral cat colony, yeah. where they would ostracize yeah. her so that there'd be more f uh, food for the, for the strong. So why yeah. is it you feel that none of them who will prey on one another, you know, play games become serious, <laughs> why they never did that to Tuna? Well, I mean, so, I mean, uh, I think the biggest part is they understand that uh, Tuna was a senior cat, and so... You know, there's a certain level of not bothering with them because, you know, it's like deference you're showing them. Uh, they definitely recognize she couldn't play at the same level. Um, the, I would say the most that would happen is some of our younger kittens would try to befriend her. You know, in the way that they befriend each other, they walk um, next to each other, like headbutting each other. And sometimes they would knock her over and trying to befriend her. But... You know, again, if you, if you don't have a lack of resources, right, so maybe the reason they do it outside, it's because you're a potential competitor, and if I let you stay around here, then you're going to be eating my food, and then there's none left for me. So if everyone's cared for, and there's not that, uh, you know, that, that instinct that exists in every living creature, like, you know, fight or flight, will to live, you know, things like that, it's not necessary here because everyone's taken care of. Mm. Yeah. Now, in this situation with Tuna, oh, she also <laughs> didn't like... Uh, really socializing with you or me sometimes. She would uh, object to that. She, she didn't seek that, other than if you were grooming her, yeah. which she required, yeah. and when she really wasn't feeling well. Could you sort of describe that? Yeah, so, I mean, again, uh, that's certainly personalities with some types of cats. I would say, uh, you know, Tuna being a senior cat, that could be, you know, just a typical thing, depending upon the life that she had. Um, again, she was never fixed, right? That's one thing we know about her as well. So to be a female, 10 years old, never fixed, would imply that she's had a lot of litters. So her body's probably very worn down. Um, she probably just needs some time to rest and some time to relax. And that's the kind of what the whole point of like adopting the seniors is about. You know, whether they have a few months or a few years, it's like a different pace. So the ones that we've taken in from the shelter, um, you know, some of them we know about their background, and it's very, like, tumultuous, and you can see why they're so at ease. Um, with her, we don't know a lot, but with seniors, I think that's part of it. You know, they just want to, you know, they take it a lot easier. You know, they just enjoy, like, she enjoyed being at the window, the bird. She doesn't need the interaction socially as much. Yeah, we're well, here, as you can see, Ajax, <laughs> who is our other neurologically affected cat, although it wasn't as severe as Tuna's neurological problem. Notice how he is resting... <laughs> on tuna and they seem to be like brother and sister in solidarity because they both had severe yeah. neurological disorders i think if we could play the video now yeah of when you first rescued mm -hmm. tuna yeah 
from the shelter, and you can describe this. Yeah, so, okay, so this was, now this was actually maybe about a week or so, because we had the, the you know, the vest come over to visit and sort of, uh, we got a couple extra things to help her feel better. But, you know, just letting her start to explore the apartment. And, you know, again, so she's clearly curious. You know, she wasn't scared to come in. You know, sometimes cats, you introduce them into your home and they'll stay in a corner and they just want to, but she right away wanted to survey the area, see what was what, like uh, maybe where she could potentially go. And as you can see, like, so one of the cats there just looking at her. So again, they realize she's not a threat. Like if it was an older cat who came in, they would have been jumping on surfaces. That, that could have been more intimidating. But she's low on the ground. She's only exploring the floor. And look, so as you can see, her eyes, they're open, but you can, that, there's where you can see like the scarring sort of, where it's like a little bit of that discoloration. Um, I mean, you can see she's very skinny and small. Now, um, it's a little harder to see too, but so, like her, the, the um, condition of her coat was really poor. Now again, it's not just like when you see conditions of coat, it's again, it's very emblematic like people. It's not like, oh, you're, you need a, a, your fur isn't that good. It's that internally something's wrong. And as, see, that's the fall right there. That's when I realized that's what she does. And then as soon as I realized that, that's when I started the planning for, I can't have her fall on the ground and putting the soft things there. So just like a senior citizen, I'm falling and I can't get up. There's no medical uh, alert pendant. And she would struggle to get herself up. And so you made it more comfortable because the falls would continue and they would get worse over time. And it would take her longer and longer periods of time to struggle back up. Yeah, and, and sometimes, um like I had to fix this one too. She would start try to walk up a, a, one of the little steps and like halfway down she would lose her footing. So I had to account for everything like that, like her not being able to keep her, her footing whatsoever. Now, you <laughs> That's cute. have rescued, as yeah. you can see here, Tuna mm -hmm. is like, I, I bonded with Tuna <laughs> because I think as you know my story, over 69 years I've survived many attempts on my life, many medical situations where Maybe if uh, I hadn't had good fortune, I would be six feet under in a pine box or a cardboard box or whatever, uh, similar to where Tuna is now. What do you think accounted for Tuna's incredible will to survive? Because you've had dozens and dozens of outdoor cats, yeah. indoor cats. Outdoor cats obviously yeah. have to have a will to survive because they're constantly being pounded by the elements and potential predators and such. Well, I mean, I, I definitely, I credit a lot to, um, you know, if, if their environment, because, you know, clearly if there's nothing to look forward for, like, you know, for any animal, they'll be doing the same sort of thing. That's why you have to keep them very engaged. So with a senior cat, you know, it may seem as though because they can't keep up pace the same way the younger ones do, but you'd be surprised. Like, I would... Um, spend time with Tuna when no one was, you know, bothering her, and I would play with a toy with her, and she actually would chase the toy, like, as slow as she seemed to be. You just have to structure, like, sort of the right um, engagements for her, so, you know, when, like, certain things, like, the minute you would come in the door, like, she hears you, she knows you're there, like, she gets up from wherever she's at because she wants to greet you, so I think there's certain clues when, you know, there's things that you're looking forward to, so I think there's a lot to that. I mean, and I think, yeah. Notice, she, when she would take her nap, I would take <laughs> my cat nap. Because as you know, I don't sleep straight through. I take a series of cat naps. <laughs> and I think Tuna recognized that, and she'd always want to be right by me. In fact, yeah, I was researching <laughs> yeah. some neighborhoods, and Tuna was assisting me in that process. We were the AARP twins. Everybody else was under AARP, certainly Nancy and the other cats. The and, and I remember when she first, uh, she first came to the house, she used to like to eat breakfast with you. So when you would have your egg sandwich in the morning, she would like wake, just walk up the little steps onto the desk, like right there where you would be having something. And uh, yeah, she would peck yeah. <laughs> my sandwich, and I would give her half the sandwich, and she would just keep pecking at it. It would take her forever to get any bit of the morsels of the egg. But she actually liked yeah, it. Yeah, she did. And what was her favorite, favorite meal of all? Well, I mean, she did like tuna. Tuna! Yeah. That's why we gave her that name, tuna. 
And what kind of tuna would you get him? Well, something that really stinks. Mm. Anything really smelly. So uh, the ones with the oils are pretty good. Uh, yeah, anything that, well, I mean, and, and she could tell because, you know, like, they, you know, they have a thing where, like, if, you, if they hear the can, right, they start moving. She could smell it the minute something was open. Like, she could be asleep all the way across. And it's like she'd wake up, walking over, she'd want some. Exactly. And as you can see, taking a cat nap again. <laughs> and look, Tuna's taking her cat nap, except her, her tongue is out because of all that intense dental deterioration she had long before she ever joined our cat colony and became our family member. So we really, really miss Tuna. And Tuna, there was a significant reason that Tuna ended coming into our house. Obviously, we had no idea. But when I eventually ran for the mayoralty against Eric Adams, and before that during the Republican primary against Fernando Mateo, I said one of my key platform issues would be to stop no-kill shelters. And I remember, our advisors said to me, no, 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 you shouldn't even be talking about animal issues. No, no, no. Just focus on crime. I said, look, after 40 years of running the Guardian Angels in New York City, if people don't know I'm a crime fighter in all that time, they'll never know. I want to focus on issues that a lot of people could agree on, even if they didn't agree with me politically, even if maybe they were Democrats or independents, whether they were socialists or radicals or reactionaries, it didn't matter. A lot of people, they love pets. So in this were the outtakes from the original first TV you can, video. You can see her walking there. Like you can catch a little bit of her, her movement, how it's like a little... Right, so these are all <laughs> she was great, yeah. before we actually did and the that, first TV commercial on the campaign. That was a notation on her uh, when she was at the shelter, too, that she purrs a lot. Look at that, look at that. face. <laughs> Okay. And now the finished product. Yeah, so using the first one, yeah. She was tired by then because it was a long bunch of takes for her. <laughs> but I must tell you, even though it gave Everybody. a sort of mini biography of me as a candidate, talked about my past, the subways, how I was the street guy, what most people bonded to in this commercial, they didn't even remember me. They remember Tuna. <laughs> It was Tuna who stole the show. And look, credit, <laughs> Tuna starring as the cat. No credits for me. Look, <laughs> Tuna, we miss you. Oh, we miss you dearly. And Tuna became the symbol of what has continued to propel us, no-kill shelters. The idea of which I actually inherited from our own owner and operator of this, WABC, Red Apple Media, John Katsimatidis, who ran for mayor in 2013 in the Republican primary. And he was the first candidate ever to have a no-kill shelter platform that he ran on. All I did, because I was able to get into the general election, was elevate that to be prime. And it all had to do with what we've said here before on the Animal Welfare Edition, both the video form that you're watching and the radio program that you can listen to one hour a week from 11 to 12 on WABC Sunday nights is what Mahatma Gandhi said, what a society does not take care of its animals, they will not take care of its people. Evidence, look at all the homeless people in the streets, the subways, the parks, all the emotionally disturbed persons who should be cared for in mental health care hospitals. And it's obvious, we don't take care of our animal friends, outdoors or indoors in many respects, and we don't take care of our humans who are wandering about there aimlessly Unfortunately, many of them not in control of their physical and mental faculties. When all was said and done, I lost the campaign to Eric Adams fair and square. But a lot of people who did not agree with my political points of view said, wow, that really gripped me that you were so animal friendly that you made it the key platform issue. So even <laughs> people extremely liberal and progressive and Democrat, where we live, the Upper West Side, <laughs> which is a sea of blue, related to this. And they come by the house where our cats <laughs> will come into the window, especially on a nice day. Nancy opens the window, and they're out there for all to see. And people are looking for tuna. 
They would call her, is Tuna there? Is Tuna there? And she would like almost identify her name, Tuna, and come hobbling and trying to get up there. And people would get all for touch. They would get all excited when they would see Tuna. And then, of course, uh, her protege, yeah. who ended up coming to vote <laughs> in my first election bid for mayor and was turned away oh, at the polling location. Gizmo, Gizmo has her own Twitter account. But Gizmo was the protege of Tuna, the beautiful Russian blue cat. Now, the best way to pay tribute to Tuna, and in fact, all of your furry little friends who are like family members to you, because they certainly are to us, is to try to say, what can we do in a society of animal lovers where some are not? because either they're jaded, they're skeptical, or they haven't been educated, or they've never had pets. I mean, key example would be uh, presidents were always known to have pets. Sometimes they really didn't have a pet, but they almost felt the need to have a pet. Donald Trump never had any pets. There's a whole world of people out there who have never had any pets, so they, they really can't relate. When we say that Tuna was a member of our family, they can't relate to that. They somehow think we're schoolboys, nut jobs, crackpots. But I will tell you, as you can see, this was the last interview that I did in the mayoral campaign. And notice, who do they want to talk to? Tuna. They say, hey, we've heard you enough, Curtis. We want to see Tuna, <laughs> who became the symbol of the campaign. But I think the most important aspect to walk away with in the image of Tuna and all of your furry little creatures who have died and gone on to quit a heaven is to say, what can we do to make all of their lives better, more tolerable, so that they don't have to go through pain and agony like clearly Tuna did long before uh, we ever came into touch with her, and most importantly, to stop the needless killing of all these dogs and cats and other animals in shelters not only here, but all throughout the United States. All throughout the United States. Absolutely. You know, Austin has no-kill shelters. Los Angeles Sometimes. now has no-kill shelters. Come on, it's the second largest city in America. And they're able to have no-kill shelters, and we won't even consider it. Embarrassment. We would never have had the joy of Tuna for two years. If not for Nancy on her birthday, seeing that Tuna was on the kill list, and by 5 o'clock that night, she would have been executed, destroyed. It was no reprieve. Governor Kathy Hochul could not call up and say, I want you to save that cat there, you know, cat 4968, uh, the one that, that Russian blue. No, nope. not even the governor could give a reprieve. And so we have to start doing this more and more. Like you see now all the empty space in New York. You're telling me that the city of New York doesn't have the ability to take some of this space and expand the number of spaces for dogs and cats and other animals so they're not all crowded together. They're not all stacked on top of one another, which is really so unfair, so inhumane. And even when a person eventually does come to the shelter and maybe wants to adopt an animal, they're so terrified, they're in such fright that they almost look like, oh, my God, I don't want to bring that, and, that cat or dog. And the key is what animal is going to get adopted is the animal that you see. You, they need visibility. If you see them when you're walking up and down the streets, they'll get adopted. If you have to go to these shelters, which are impossible to get to, and you make an appointment and you're waiting online, they'll never get adopted. Visibility is key. Right, and think of it. How many times have people on the spot at a pet store purchase a dog or a cat or a kitten or a puppy dog because they were in the window? And all of a sudden, they were infatuated. They fell in love. They said, no, no. Or your child said, oh, daddy, mommy, baby. And you went in and you made a purchase of somebody who was not property. Don't think of them as property. But became a beloved family member. In fact, so much so that first when Hope died, who was our calico cat that Nancy had rescued and got medical treatment for, she had severe cancer. She gave us another two years of life. And when she died of a stroke and died in Nancy's arm, she was stroked out. I cried like a baby for days. Likewise for Tuna. I never cried for my father, Chester, who I honored and I had a great relationship with, or my mother, Francesca, who I honored or had a great relationship to. And a lot of people might say, well, well you didn't cry for your mom and dad. No. But for Tuna? 
I'm still hurting. I'm still crying. I'll never get over Tunis loss. Never. So for all of you who have had animals in your life, don't ever let the hurt of a lost animal friend or family member of yours mm-hmm. prevent you mm-hmm. from going out and continuing to adopt. I hear many people yeah, mention true. sometimes, I can never do that again. You yeah. must. Yeah, you have to. Or they will be slaughtered. Yep. They will be deprived of a life. Think of Tuna. Mm-hmm. She had two more years that she was not entitled to, according to the city of New York, the assembly line. You know, just get rid of her. And then she was able to give her that And look at the higher purpose that she serves. Right. Yeah. Became the symbol of the no-kill shelters in New York City. And we will eventually get to that point. And Tuna will have become the visible and now spiritual symbol of that effort. So thanks to all of you. Again, you got to listen on Sunday nights, 11 or 12. If you missed any of the past episodes, exclusive to WABC, the Animal Welfare Hour, go to wabcradio.com for all of those podcasts. Share it with everybody. Blast it out. And these videos, every week, a half hour, you, it's uploaded on YouTube, the WABC YouTube channel, exclusive to them. Just type in Red Apple Media. And again, once you viewed it, don't be selfish. Blast it out to everybody you know. Animal lovers or people who never understood why we are so emotional about our animal family members. So once again, Nancy, thank you. <laughs> and we're going to keep the image of tuna alive for so many reasons. My best bud, my AARP friend that I'm still sitting shiver for and will continue to do so till the ends of time.